spent on my SLP, which is woefully underprepared. Well, you got time left. Yes. All right. So um, I want to talk about some things that I've been getting questions from people on, um, including dealing with the command line argument for PA4. Um, looking at file directories in Eclipse and figuring out where things are. Um, and this code that I was trying to do uh, Wednesday in the morning section that I didn't get to work. I figured out how to make that work and I learned something on the way. So I want to talk about that code. Um, and then we'll talk about the fate of the universe, or the galaxy at least. Um, and play around with threads some. Um, so let me pass around to sign in. I think this is my last day I'm going to do attendance. So, um, so you're here for like the last one, which is awesome. Um, all right, so any questions before we jump into all of that? Yeah? So you're not going to test for command line argument in PA4, you're just going to run as is? I'm only going to run with a command line argument. I'm not going to run it without. So my plan is I'll have my own database file and I'll run your code with that as a command line argument so that it uses my database file. Okay. So um so let's make a Java project. Let's just call it and let's make a main class. And I'll go ahead and do a public static void main inside here. Oh, you can see that when you make it. Yeah, and then it does all this typing for you. Well, that was easy. Yeah. All right, so um, so the goal is if you just if I just run your main method without any arguments, it should have hardwired some sort of, you know, default database inside. And if you are testing this yourself over and over and over again, right, just make that the database of, you know, whatever it is that you're using. Um, and you're going to put in the full path and it might have backslashes and all kinds of stuff like that. But then you want the user to be able to run it and say, you know, use this database file instead um, and pick it up from the arguments. And so it's pretty easy to do that. Um, so, so you got a class, right? Call it something better than go. And it's got a really cool method in there called something better than do stuff. And let's say that down in do stuff, you're doing the following. So you're going to construct a scanner off of a new file, which is hardwired to, you know, my hardwired file name. So maybe it's like C users, Nick blah blah scholar. scholar yeah that's good all right and as usual you need to put this in a try catch block um, oh it doesn't like the backslash Didn't like that one single slash. Nick, okay. Nick and blah blah are not 
are not so free by a slash. Yeah, it's a, it's a fictitious path, path though, so because we're not going to actually open it. Okay, so so put it in the try catch block, um, and then. and then do something. So this is kind of a sidebar. It doesn't like SC right here. And the comment is the local variable SC may not have been initialized, right? And if I come up here and I just say this equals null, my error goes away, right? Because now it's got an initial value. But do we ever want SC to actually be null? I mean, if SC is null and we try to do something like SC.nextLine, <coughs> we're going to get a null pointer exception and our program gives up. So just because you see an error and it offers very helpfully to say like, oh, here's a quick fix, initialize the variable, right? That's not necessarily something that you want to do. So think about why SC might be null. What else could I do to get rid of this error? So under what situation might I end up at this while statement without SC having been initialized? Yeah. If something goes wrong when I construct S the scanner, which I'm assigning to SC, I might jump down to my catch loop, right, without SC having gotten a value. So make a, make a file outside of the scanner? Uh, I maybe I could do or something. Try catch for the file itself. Uh, the file won't throw a, an exception. It's only when you construct a scanner. If the scanner fails to construct, what do I want to do though? Do I want to keep going with this program? No. Probably not. Really, if if I end up down in my catch block, I can print out a stack trace. And I can print a message saying what went wrong, but I can also just say I'm done. And if I return there, my error goes away on the SC may not have been initialized. But in the case, it's going to be the hour we don't need to return. Well, this is just an example, right? Um, but yeah, if you try to open a file and it doesn't exist in your program, probably just print an error message and return because then they're, they're doing something wrong. All right, so, um, so this, is, this is something like what you're going to have in your code, right? Somewhere you're going to construct a scanner. Um, and in this case, it's got a hardwired path. OK, if you want to do this um, the other way that, that lets you take an argument from the command line um, or use this as default, it's pretty straightforward to do. So. Here's something we could do. We could have do stuff take an argument, which is a file name. And down here, when we construct the scanner, instead of using that hardwired path, we can just use that file name that was passed to do stuff. And then up here, we can do the following. So if the argument length is zero, we'll just do stuff and we'll pass our default file name to do stuff and it'll open up from that file. Otherwise, we'll do stuff and we'll pass it rx bracket zero. So it's a really minor change, right? If you've already got something that's constructing a scanner somewhere, instead of just hardwiring a path to it, write yourself an if statement somewhere before you actually open that scanner and say, if any arguments were specified, use that first argument as the file name. Otherwise, use your default path as the file name. Does that make sense? So if you've just been working with a hardwired file name all along and you're getting ready to submit and you want to handle that arg0 business, right, it's a pretty small 
tweak. Um, but it's an important one because that's the way I'm going to test your code. And if it doesn't work with a command line argument, I'll take off some points. And then I got to go in and I got to start editing your code and find everywhere that you refer to that file by name. And I got to edit it and change it to my file name path. And, and so we're trying to avoid that. How do we give it what's like command line argument? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's the other thing I wanted to mention. Um, so you have to go to the run tab. Yeah. So, so right click on your project, come down to properties, and then look for run debug settings. And well, I've never run this, so let's go ahead and run it. Okay, so right click on your project, properties, run debug settings. There should be one launch configuration, right, which is the name of your main class. Click on that, say edit, come over here to arguments, and now you can specify your command line arguments. I don't know why that is like so many steps for something so you basic. You can also do it by going to the run tab and do run configurations, and then you can do the same thing similar to that. Uh, where's the run tab? Up there, at the top. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So run, um, run configurations. Cool. Okay, that's better. That's faster. And then put in your arguments. Okay, cool. And you have to apply it to. Yeah. Nice. Cool. All right. So good on command line argument business? In the uh, else portion of that, uh, would it be main arc zero or is it two stuff? Uh, main <laughs> is not a class. Main is oh. a method. And args is a, an argument, right? So we're just picking up the value of this uh. parameter to this method. All right. Sorry? Yeah. Wait, what are you talking about? So you mean if it doesn't exist? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, so in your catch block, you should do something reasonable, like say, you know, file such and such does not exist, goodbye, and then just exit. All right, so let's let's look briefly at file IO. So let's make a class. Put in the public static void main. So um, people have been trying to figure out where their files are. So we'll do ha ha ha. So if you look at the file documentation for Java IO file, it's got a bunch of methods. If you look at the get methods, uh, first one is get absolute file, get absolute path. So return the absolute path name string of this abstract path name, right? So that can be used to tell us what our path is. So let's just go ahead and run that. And it tells us, for me, it's home nick files eclipse delete me io223 ha ha ha. So this is the area in which I have all my workspaces. This is the actual name of the workspace when you start Eclipse, if it asks you for which workspace, or if you switch, I called it delete me. This is the name of the project, and this is the actual file. So 
So if I make a print writer, and that's got to go in a try catch block. So we can use pw like system.out, we can write some stuff into that file, we can close the file. And so if I go through my directory tree and come down to Eclipse and delete me and IO223, there's the stuff that's in my folder right now. And so if I run this code, it creates a haha.txt over here on the right, and it's got the two lines that we wrote into it. And similarly, if, um, if we make a scanner, And since we're sitting in this directory over here, if I go down to the source directory, I should have all my source code. So we can open a file just called source slash main.java. And then put that in the try catch block. And then we can read from that. Sorry? There's a space between main and dot. Java. There is a space. And that's going to mess it up. So we're going to open a file, and I'm just specifying source slash main.java. It's a relative path name, but presumably my directory is um, this directory one spot up from my source dir. And so this should move into the source directory and grab main.java, which is all of this. And then just our usual loop where we iterate as long as there's a next line, grab the next line, print it out. And so if we run this... Right, we get our source code. So on my setup, that's where files exist if I don't specify a path. It may be different on your system, right? I mean, it's going to be a different workspace name, but, but it's possible that different versions of Eclipse do this in different places. I don't know. Because I always try to use absolute path names, right? Um, and if you export this thing as a runnable jar, and try to run it, and unless you're sitting in the same directory, a default file name like haha.txt is going to assume a different location. So it never hurts to put in like full path names. All right, so questions on that? All right, we're good on files. this up in the previous section we we're doing some stuff all 
All right, so this was the code that I was playing with on Wednesday. And the idea was we had a main thread that kicks off here. Um, and the first thing it does is create a new thread called MT, my thread. And it starts my thread. And then it looks at my thread's i value, the value of the variable i. And my thread is a really simple thread. All it's going to do, let me get rid of this. We don't need this. All it's going to do is initialize i to 0 and then go through a loop 100 times, increment i, and print out t for thread followed by the value of i. And when it's done 100 times, it'll do a print line and it just exits. So that's what my thread mt is going to do. And the main thread is going to wait until mt's i value is equal to at least 50. And once it's equal to 50 or more, it'll kick out of the empty while loop, and then it'll iterate its own i equals 0 to 100 loop, printing out m followed by the integer value. And as we expect, since these are two threads, we'll see some interleaving of the outputs from the main thread and this thread. Well, when I run it, it doesn't do any of that. The MT thread runs and prints out from 0 to 99, but the main thread never even starts printing anything. And so I think it was in the morning class Wednesday, I was happily doing a demo, and this happened. <laughs> and I tried a few obvious fixes and was unable to fix it. So Wednesday, I spent off and on several hours coming back to this and trying different things and did some googling and tried some more things and then Thursday morning about four o'clock had an idea and got up and tried that and that helped but it still didn't work and finally Thursday afternoon I like stumbled across the answer online um, and this is good knowledge so um, so here's the deal we have two threads executing okay they could be running on different cores in a multi-core system, um, but they're communicating through a mechanism called shared memory. Right? Basically, this thread has an integer named i, and it's got you know, different values, it increments it, and so on and so forth. And the main thread is trying to read what mt's i value is. So mt has its own process space, it's got its own memory, its own stack, and so on. Main thread, same thing. The main thread is trying to sort of peek at the memory of this MT thread. Okay? It's a perfectly valid way to share information between threads. You either have shared memory or you do what's called message passing, where you basically somehow send information. Um, so this is shared memory. But here's the problem slash feature. Threads apparently have a local cache of their memory inside the JVM. And so the first time that this thing checks mt.i and it finds that it's equal to probably zero, every time that it goes back and checks mt.i, it's reading its locally cached value. And even though this value of i gets updated in the mt thread, the cache memory in our main thread becomes stale. Right? So cache coherence is a classic problem in computer architecture. You have a cache that stores a local copy of your main memory because it's expensive to go out to main memory. Well, it's expensive for this main thread to communicate with this new thread, MT, and actually interrogate its memory. And so to save on efficiency, um, it caches these values until it's told that the value has changed. It never gets told. And I can put in like one print statement here and it'll start working. And I can put in a sleep for 100 nanoseconds and it'll work. 100 microseconds, uh, milli, and if I put in a sleep for 10, it doesn't work. And there's all kinds of things that will make it work or not work. So here's the reliable way to make it work. Use the keyword volatile. And if I say i is a volatile variable, it says do not cache it. And that's all we need. So anytime that something tries to grab this value, it's forcing the JVM to actually go into the memory space where that variable is stored and read it instead of reading a local copy. And so if we do this, compile it up and run it, there's what we were expecting. Well, that wasn't exactly what we were expecting, but they're at least both running. This is more what we were expecting. So um, 
because that's a little mixed up. So I have this set so that as soon as the main loop starts, if i is equal to zero, it prints out a new line. And so the MT thread ran, and it did get to 50, and it also got to 51, 52, 53, and it was somewhere around here. The mains while loop, which said is MTI less than 50, came back and said no. And so right here is where the main for loop started. Found I was equal to zero, and so it printed that out. And then way down here, it actually printed M0, and then M1, and then these got interleaved with the T's, and then eventually T finished down here, and then M finished. And as before, each time that we do this, we're most likely to get um, get different behavior. So there, exactly a T50 main kicked in and did its new line. And then it did a bunch of M's all the way up to, it looks like, 90, and then T came back, and so on. Uh, T kicked in over there. All right, and it's it's depends on asynchronous things like what's going on in the universe as to what exactly the behavior is going to be. But anyway, the punchline of that was, you know, you can share information between these threads by just looking at values of variables because the main method has access to the MT thread because it's the thing that constructed the MT object and so it can read its variables. And of course you can have accessors and mutators to do this correctly. Um, and the MT thread has no way of getting to the parent's variables, right? But the parent can do something like pass a reference to itself to the new thread. And so we could do something like, um, after we construct MT, we could say MT.remember me and we could pass this. And down here, we could have, um, well, I already have a variable named save parent of type buggy. That's the type of class that's up there. And then we could have public void remember me, which gets a buggy t. And when remember me is called, it takes the argument, which was this, right? It's the, the main threads. Um, and it sticks that in save parent. And then later on, you can do something like save parent dot, you know, whatever value you want to get to from the main thread. So you can set up communication back and forth. And it's something that may be useful when we get to PA5, because we're going to have lots of threads probably. You're probably going to have at least four threads, possibly five running, depending on your organization. All right, we got 20 minutes left. That's enough time to decide the fate of the galaxy. So, so we're going to have an election online. Um, and we're going to write some Java code to tally votes and monitor the election and decide the outcome of it. Okay, and the election is for Emperor of the Galaxy, and there are two candidates running by the name of Yoda and Darth Vader. Okay, and we've been hired to make the software to do the voting. So, um, and apparently, Java is the universal language. It is. It is. This was this was told a long time ago. Um, so here's our voting machine uh, demonstration. So voter test is our main class. It's got our public static void main. And really, really simple process, right? So first we create a vote recorder. The vote recorder is a central repository that stores all of the voting tallies. So we're going to have three separate voting machines. They're going to send their information into this vote recorder. It's going to tally everything up. Okay. So we construct three voting machines. And the constructor takes a pair of arguments, just an ID, and the identity of the vote recorder object. And then each of these is going to run as an independent thread and is going to simulate the behavior of people coming to the polls and casting a vote. Okay, and we're going to see what, what, um, what we end up with. So um, 
the vote recorder looks like this. So we have tallies for the two candidates, Darth Vader and Yoda. And the constructor for the vote recorder zeroes those tallies out. That's really important for an election, right? Um, so they both start with zero votes. And then we have accessors and mutators for those tallies. So we can get Darth Vader or Yoda's count, or we can set those counts. And we have a monitor so that we can show the tally at any point we want just by calling show votes. Right, so that's going to give us some information as the day progresses. That's the whole vote recorder class. So the voting machine itself, well, it's going to be constructed with an ID and a vote recorder object. So the constructor, we just pass those two arguments, and then we just save them in these local variables. So ID is the ID of the machine, and vote recorder, VR, is the way we're going to tally the votes. Okay, so we're going to have a run method that's called when the process starts. Okay, so in the beginning we said voting machine 1.start, 2.start, and so on. That's going to create a new thread and then start executing the run method. Okay, and, and the simulation is going to be that 150 people vote for Yoda and 100 people vote for Darth Vader. All right, so um, first we, we mimic uh, the Yoda supporters. Right, and they show up right and early in the morning. They've just done their yoga and had some oatmeal, and now they're coming to vote. And there's 150 of them. Okay, so um, each one votes as follows. Um, we get the current vote for Yoda. Um, they hang out for a random period of time, a few milliseconds, because they're kind of mellow. Um, they increment the current vote and then they write it back. Okay, so they're basically adding one vote for Yoda. Um, and every time that one of these 150 people votes, we're going to show the count of total votes. Right? So we're going to call the vote sh show votes method. And then later on in the day, the Darth Vader supporters show up, and there's 100 of, of them, and they just read the current tally, increment, write it back. And that's the whole, that's the whole um, voting process. So we've got three voting machines. Each one should cast 150 votes for Yoda, 100 for Darth Vader. At the end of the day, it should be 450 for Yoda, 300 for Darth, right? So let's run this. Something awkward is going to happen with incident. Of course. All right, ready? Fate of the galaxy. Boom. Uh-oh. Yoda only got 148 votes. That's awkward. That's awkward. Let's try it again. He got 152 that time. It's random. But he's still losing. Let's try one more. Best out of three. 162. It keeps incrementing. He's on a roll. Let's do best out of five. All right, he's down to 151. Um, yeah, so, so Darth Vader wins every time. And if we look at this, Right. Let's see how the vote tally is going. So it starts off, Yoda gets the first vote, and then somebody voted, but Yoda still only has one vote. And then Yoda gets two votes, and then all of a sudden Yoda's count total is back down to one. And it's two, three, four, down to three, four, five, six, and then it jumps back down to three. And there's really funny stuff going on here. <laughs> is it thread mishandling? Yeah. And when people show up and start voting for Darth Vader, right? It stops all together. That's just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? And Yoda made it up to 148, but never makes any progress beyond that. Well, they just when did, lost six two. votes. And Darth Vader just keeps tallying up and mm -hmm. went down to 141, yes. back up to 147. And Darth Vader's just pulled ahead, and and people are wringing their hands and drinking scotch now um, <laughs> to deal with this. So, um, so what's going on here? Voter fraud. Voter fraud. And you know, we do electronic voting, and it's closed source software, which means you're relying on whatever the team of people is that wrote the software to not do something like this by mistake 
you know, or on purpose, but more likely by mistake, um, so as opposed to open source where you've got you know millions of eyes on it. So one for forty-seven is it a random number? It's not really random, but it's definitely not four hundred and fifty, um, and it does seem to change from run to run. And I can tell you this. If we only do one voting machine, it works quite well, doesn't it? Works perfectly well. 150 Yoda, 100 Darth, and it'll do that every time. That's because there are multiple threads running. So there's That's something to do with multiple threads. So what are your thoughts? It's re each tally is reset in each thread. Sometimes. Um, I don't think it's cash related. At least not directly. And it's essentially the same code for Yoda and Darth, other than Yoda has this random delay, which is just a short delay tossed in. So let's draw this out. We've got thread one. And how do we cast a vote for Yoda? So we call uh, get Yoda from the vote recorder, and we save that to current vote. So let's say current vote equals get Yoda. Current vote equals current vote plus one. And then we say set Yoda that value of current vote. And we have a second thread which does the same thing. And we'll do one more. So let's say thread one starts running. And let's say that Yoda has no votes. OK, we're just starting off. So thread one starts, and thread two starts a little later, and thread three starts a little later, just because we said one start, two start, three start. OK, so thread one gets down to here, and it says, OK, first let's see what Yoda's vote count is. It's 0. So it sets CV equal to 0. And then it adds 1, so CV is equal to 1. At the same time, thread 2 is saying, my copy of CV I'm going to set to the current vote for Yoda. That's a 0. And I'm going to increment that, so now CV is going to be 1. And maybe thread 3 is doing the same thing. And now thread 1 says, set Yoda equal to CV, so now Yoda is equal to 1. And then thread 2 says set Yoda to CV, so Yoda is equal to 1. And thread 3 says set Yoda to CV, and CV is 1, so Yoda is equal to 1. So it theoretically only counts up to um, um, 50 or something. Yeah. Something. In this case, three votes were cast, but it only counted as one vote. Because it keeps setting to the same at a point. Yeah. Now, the next time that this while loop goes through this for loop, right, it might say, OK, set CV equal to get Yoda, so that's 1, increment it, so that's 2. And it might write that before thread 2 gets around to the top of its for loop. So the second time thread 2 goes through, it says, OK, get Yoda, that's 2, increment that, that's 3, set Yoda to 3. 
And so those two votes counted as two votes, right? But sometimes they may only count as one. Sometimes all three threads might only count as one. So, so this is, yeah, this is the problem, right? This temp variable. Um, and I threw that little delay in there, right? Where they're like meditating before they pull the lever. And I threw that delay in there deliberately to increase the chance that while this was running, some other thread would also start that same section of code. And if I make that delay bigger, I can force the sum to be lower. And if I get rid of that delay, it'll work fine, which is why Yoda's votes all tended to count. Now, Yoda's votes could, or Darth Vader's votes could still end up doing this, but it's less likely, right? But basically, the problem is this process here, these three steps, really shouldn't be interrupted. Once you read the current total for Yoda, you want to increment it and write it back before any other process does anything with this vote total. So this is something called a read, modify, write. And when you do like an advanced 270 course where you do computer architecture and assembly language, you spend a lot of time thinking about read, modify, write. Right? When you say increment register, uh, if you've done 270, you say increment file register 12, right? And you say, okay, just add one to the contents of the register. You're actually doing a read, modify, write. The CPU is reading the value of register 12, modifying it by adding one, and then writing it back in. And sometimes it's really important to know that there's this three-step process going on. And ideally, you would like to make sure that nothing interrupts you while this is happening. You need some kind of flag. You need some kind of flag. And the problem here is you could try to create a flag. It's typically called a semaphore, right? And basically, in the beginning here, you could say, is anybody using Yoda's vote count right now? Right? And if nobody's using it, you can set a flag that's shared by all the threads and say, I'm using Yoda's vote count. Nobody else touch it. And when thread two wants to come in here, it'll first look and say, is anybody using the vote count? It'll see your flag and it'll wait. Go ahead. And if it, work, what, if it happens at the same time, that's when they are Yeah, so if both threads check the flag at the same time, nope, nobody's using it, they both raise the flag and say, I'm the only one using Yoda's vote count right now. You've got a problem, right? Because how do you know if the vote count, if the flag is in use, right, you've got to read the value from memory of this shared flag. And then if you want to have exclusive access, you've got to modify it, and you've got to write it back into memory. And that's another read, modify, write operation. And if you read this variable and then change its value by writing it back, and during that process someone else does the same thing, you've got the exact same situation. So the idea here is, we need an atomic operation. We need to know that we're doing a read, modify, write, and we can't be interrupted in the middle. And that's hard to do in general. Um, so most processors have some kind of hardware support to allow you to do this, right? And at the level of the hardware, below the level of machine language instructions, right, inside the state machine that is the CPU, you can set this up. You can have an instruction which is like an uninterruptible read, modify, write. So on a JVM, that's a virtual machine. The people who wrote the software that is the JVM can do this inside. And so there are mechanisms for getting this exclusive access to a set of code. And the keyword is synchronized. So mainly what we're going to see is around a block of code, we're going to use the keyword synchronized, and then everything in this block is only going to be allowed to be executed by one thread at a time. If we have a second thread that's executing the same code and it comes to the synchronized block, it will first ask the JVM, is there anybody else executing this code? And if there is, 
that thread will wait until nobody else is executing it anymore. And this will basically let us guarantee that only one thread is reading, updating, and rewriting the vote total. So the synchronized method um, basically is raising a flag, right? You got to tell it the name of a flag to use. And it can be almost anything. But um, if I had two different sets of code that I wanted to synchronize and they were different from each other, I would want each one to use its own flag, basically. So ha is a totally useless, um, totally useless class. It doesn't do anything, but nonetheless, when I construct it, I have an object, right? This object H, and I can use that to synchronize. And it seems weird, but it works. Um, you can use like int if you want. Um, you can't use a primitive, um, and it's got to be an object. But if you had an integer uppercase I object, you could use that, or a rectangle, or or whatever. And if you're just synchronizing one block of code, it seems kind of, of superfluous, but, um, but it lets you have different blocks with different flags. All right, so this set of code will only be run by one thread at a time. Even though we have that delay in there, it means that some of the other threads will block until this thread finishes. And then same thing with Darth Vader's loop. Um, so let's compile that up. And go ahead and run that. And you've got perfect voting now. Not really. Oh, well, I took out the, that's only one machine. Um, no, what did I do? Uh, da -da 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 -da. I changed something. Are you sure the voter machine's not? Canceled out? Hmm. Got three voting machines. I'm running them. Maybe the galaxy is just doomed for the long weekend. <laughs> well, that's really weird. Well, that's even stranger. Yeah. It makes me feel better. Something tells me it's not completely synchronized. Yeah, I got something I changed in here. And I just gotta remember what it is. So VM one star, two star, three star. Yeah. Here's an invisible five hundred dollar bill if you find it. I'm pretty sure I recompiled it, but I'm about to do that again. H. 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 Um, yeah, that's fine. Oh, the one I construct. When you defined the, uh, uh, it oh. says H only. Right, okay, okay, so yeah, so this is a change I made, right? Um, so in my main method, I'm constructing a ha huh object, and I'm passing that to my voting machine. But in my voting machine, I'm ignoring that. I'm creating my own version of, um, of H, and I'm synchronizing on that. And my threads are not synchronized, right? Why? Because each thread has its own object H. So the flag that I'm using in thread 1 is different from the flag I'm using in thread 2. Right, I'm using the flag that I constructed inside the thread, so they're not synchronizing, right? Each one has their own flag, it's not blocking. So that was a, a demonstration. Um, so if you, if you construct with a common flag, right, which came from the main method, and I save that in my H, and I use that H to synchronize, now they're all using the same flag. So now we got balance of the galaxy again. <laughs> The galaxy, it's all Yay, just in time for a long weekend. All right, so um, so we'll talk a little more about this on Tuesday, right? No class Monday. Um, Tuesday, we will talk about um, the dining philosophers, favorite topic. Um, 
which is a, a thought exercise that relates to um, multiprocessing and concurrency and synchronization and resource contention. And we'll talk about some of the ways you can get into trouble using these synchronized blocks, things like deadlock and live lock and so on. So we'll talk about that Tuesday, maybe wrap it up on Wednesday, and then we'll start talking about sockets and networking and um, moving towards PA5, which we'll talk about next Friday. All right, so have a really good long weekend, and I will see you next week.